afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the session on uh, innovation and in mountain biking. Um, my name is Danny Cow. I work for the Mountain Bike Centre of Scotland, and also on the call with me just now are uh, three of my colleagues, uh, starting from my top left, Dr. Lewis Kirkwood, uh, Dr. Leslie Ingram Sills, and um, Associate Professor Tony Westbury. Um, we've got till four o'clock, and I'm going to start in a moment by giving a brief presentation by way of introduction, five or ten minutes. And then we have three uh, keynote talks and presentations from the academics uh, from Napier and Mountain Bike Centre of Scotland, giving their latest updates into um, where we are. Um, we'll have the chance of, for question and answers at the end of each of the academic presentations. We'll do about three to five minutes. And then we should have a good chunk of time at the uh, end of the, the session for Q&As. Um, just a, a matter of housekeeping, um, if you can please use the Q&A section that's on the panel, you're probably all really well versed of it now with the other sessions that you've been in. Um, I will be going through chairing the session and then at the end, I'll be taking the questions and, and putting them to the academics. And if there's any technical issues or anything like that, if you could please use the chat function. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen now and we'll do a short presentation before I pass over to Tony. Okay. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that there. Um, yes, yeah, so as I say, we'll have the, the three presentations and then the question and answer at the end. Um, to those that aren't aware, uh, I'll just give you some introduction into the uh, Mountain Bike Centre of Scotland. So the Mountain Bike Centre of Scotland, um, we are hosted by Edinburgh Napier University and our uh, partners are developing mountain biking in Scotland and also Scottish Enterprise. And we receive our core funding through from the Scottish Government. I'll go in a moment into a little bit more about uh, what we do. Um, who we are, this is a nice wee snapshot of the team. Um, so on the call today, we have Leslie, Tony and Lewis. Um, the lead academic for the Mountain Bike Centre is Professor Garen Florida James. And the person that makes everything work in the background is Don Johnson. And then we also have one of our other academics, uh, Dr. Tom Campbell, who will feature in some of the other presentations later on. Big thing with the Mountain Bike Centre of Scotland is the partnership work that we do. Um, we've got the main man himself, Graham McLean, uh, from Developing Mountain Biking in Scotland, who sits on our board. And then from the Economic Development Agency, Scottish Enterprise, we have uh, Moira Forsyth. And Moira, um, it was her brainchild back in, I think, 2012, she had the idea for this innovation centre. And then something I'll go on to talk about in a minute is the Borderlands Growth Fund deal and the future mountain bike innovation uh, hub that will be based within the Tweed Valley. And Ed Shoot from Developing Mountain Biking in Scotland, he's the project manager there. So we've got quite a decent sized team. Brief bit of history. Mountain Bike Centre of Scotland was launched in 2014. Uh, that's our base, the top floor there, just above the uh, Forestry Commission at Glentress. We cover all of Scotland. Now, what are we? We are a national centre for mountain biking innovation and excellence. Now, what does that mean? That means that within Scotland, we support um, businesses of all shapes and sizes uh, to develop world-class mountain bike and cycling products and services. And we feel we are leading the world in terms of mountain bike innovation. So our goal really is we want to build an industry of product and service companies within Scotland to try to rival where we are with the, the mountain bike tourism. So a brief snapshot of how we can help businesses, be they from Scotland, from the rest of the UK or the rest of the world. Um, really, uh, we started off before I joined with um, innovation clinics that Geraint and Leslie and uh, Moira would run with Graham. And I think they described it nicely as a, a friendly dragon's den. Um, and they wanted people to come forward with ideas. Now, some of these people are um, individuals and entrepreneurs whose idea hasn't made it to the back of the fag packet. And some of these are really well-established companies that are looking to diversify within the recycling sector. 
either way, they're more than welcome. So just as an idea of how we can take it, um, we offer these innovation clinics and we also host a series of events in various sectors uh, where we'll partner up with experts, be it in engineering or product design. We'll also help companies with their research and development. And one of the uh, bodies in Scotland that we use is Interface. They uh, help with knowledge exchange between uh, businesses and academia. And then we've also done an awful lot of focus groups with companies where around a table and everyone signing confidentiality agreements, we can get a bunch of weekend warrior riders to give their input into what they think a new product should need or want, be it we did one for suspension setup, we did one for a company that made uh, equipment for people riding their bikes with their dogs. And then we can also bring in uh, elite riders as well that we have access to through the cycling community. Product development and launch, and this is the big thing of what we do, is helping companies to get funding. And this is where I'll work with um, Moira and our colleagues at Scottish Enterprise, where companies can get funding through crowdfunding, through competitions like Scottish Edge, and through uh, Interface to get money to work with university. And then what we're going to be talking about through Leslie, through uh, Tony and through Lewis, is the growth. It's the commercial university projects. Three examples from Edinburgh Napier University, and we have engaged with other companies in the past. And then also we've worked with agencies to take companies to Eurobike. So really we'll help with these companies from whatever size they are at any different stage on this path here. Now, why do we focus on the cycling industry? And this is something that for people out with the cycling industry, I have a bit of a challenge trying to convince them because we'll all know out there people who think uh, that you're an absolute nutter, that you've spent two to five to 10,000 pounds on your mountain bike or road bike, because they might not even spend that on the car. Um, and for them, they think that's some little niche and that most bikes are just 200 pound bikes that you buy from Halfords and it's just something you do as a kid. And they, in Scotland and in the UK, seeing cycling tourism, that's taken seriously as, as, as why we're at this conference and all the good work that developing mountain biking in Scotland have done with partners. But the manufacturing side of things, as with other manufacturing in Scotland and the UK, we lag a little bit behind. But there's some amazing um, figures and some amazing growth within the cycling market, as people probably would have seen through the COVID lockdown. Some good stats up there at the size of the UK cycling industry. The interesting one, I think, is the fact that car companies are now looking at cycling with the rise of e-bikes. And then we can see at the bottom there what the, the forecast, I think this forecast actually is a bit out of date now as well. But you're looking at global sales of 70 billion US dollars within a few years time. So it is a big industry. Within Scotland, we did a, 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 a survey and study uh, with developing mountain biking in Scotland a while ago. And this forecast showed that our product business industry should be worth 92 million by the, the middle of this forthcoming decade. So it's a big sector for Scotland. A new body that's been created that we are now members of is Cycling Industries Europe. Um, they were formed a couple of years ago, really to lobby the European Union and also national governments to show the size of this industry. And I've stolen some stats from them there that they had another presentation. Now, again, if you think about um, some other industries such as as it says there, the coal, steel or mining, how much support they've traditionally had from governments in the past. It's actually more people work within the cycling industry. And then the cycle tourism economy, not what we're discussing today, but that's bigger than the whole cruise ship industry. And then there's the health savings. And then also uh, you'll read in the press about how Teslas and Nissan Leafs are going to save us. They're obviously great if you can afford one and trans transition away from your uh, uh, petrol or diesel car. However, e-bikes actually outsell cars, electric cars, by 10 to 1. So there's an awful lot of growth there, and it's a serious um, subject. Now, moving on and coming towards the end of this introduction, what is innovation in mountain biking? Now, when you think of innovation, innovation, you think of high-tech equipment, you know, cutting-edge innovation. You think of aerospace, defence, so on and so forth. And this is a great example here. Uh, this is one of our companies from Scotland, a chap called Mark Revelius, who's based in Edinburgh, and he's developed the Intradrive. Now, what this is, is this is a combined um, planetary gearbox, if you think like a pinion, 
and it's combined with an e-bike drive motor. So it's all within one unit. Fantastic, uh, you know, new innovative product there. Um, you know, chance for real game changing, um, uh, you know, applications within the mountain bike and cycling world. So that is, you know, absolutely fantastic high end innovation. However, innovation is more than just high tech, high end goods. Now, I know apologies, you probably can't focus in and read the individual writing on this graphic at the side here. But this was a, an exercise that was done a while ago. And really, it was just to map out where is mountain biking with knowledge transfer. And you can see down the left hand side some of the sectors that we've engaged with. So innovation, yes, it is gearboxes and electric motors, but it's also clothing. It's also, we've done a lot of innovative work with sports drinks and look, making sure the hydration's right, uh, product design, uh, digital apps as well, and a whole host of different things. And also I want you to think through when you're listening to the next few presentations, which are on mental health, on vibration, you know, and a whole host of other research, how could this work from a company? How could we engage? How could this benefit our brand, our product design? So innovation, yes, it is the gearboxes, but it's a lot more than that. Briefly, um, some good news, hopefully coming up in the next couple of months, we shall hopefully receive funding uh, approval for the world's first mountain bike innovation center. Uh, one such plan is to put it in this disused mill. This is obviously just a mock-up in uh, Inner Leiden in the Scottish borders. And that's a multi-million pound investment around 19 million pound from the UK and Scottish governments. And that will see a whole bunch of kit and equipment within there, uh, outdoor instrument, test tracks, access to trails. And a big thing we're looking at, and uh, Lewis will cover later in his, his, his uh, thing is, what could we use an indoor instrumented test track for? He, he gives us one application there. So this will allow companies within Scotland to use the Maker Workshop and Product Innovation Lab. They may be a small company that wants to just come in and do some very rapid prototyping. We're looking at having accelerated lifetime testing chambers potentially in there as well. You think about mountain biking, you think about the amount of abuse that a mountain bike goes through, especially within Scotland with all the componentry. And this is hopefully forthcoming, and there's been other presentations on this uh, over the past. Now, we want to work with you. Have you always had an idea for a product or service? If you thought I could do something better than that, I know lots of people have. Um, drop me a line afterwards or put in your questions here. You might want to put it public or you might want to keep it confidential. Also, international companies. We've had some great projects recently that haven't quite got sign off and we can't put them in the public domain, but we can do, um, you know, uh, confidential and commercial projects with you, looking at the various uh, innovative um, uh, subjects, such as the next few speakers will talk through. We also have access to um, our partners at the University of Strathclyde. And they have the Lightweight Manufacturing Centre and the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. So it may be you want to look at malleable composites, lightweighting metals, etc. We have the uh, able to able to do that for you. So just uh, ending for myself and before I, I pass over to Tony in a moment, please write down your questions in the online chat. Uh, sorry, in the online Q&A. Um, I will monitor them. We'll have a few minutes at the end of Tony, Leslie and Lewis's and then uh, a larger section at the end. Um, if we don't get to you, please send an email to, to mtb at napier.ac.uk. Give us a phone and we'll be able to go from there. And thank you very much. So I'm just going to stop sharing the screen and we'll have that normal clumsy handover. And I'll pass over to Tony, who will be giving us the first presentation. Tony. Can we see that? Got it? Thank you very much. OK, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Danny. And thank you to everybody tuned in listening to this. Anybody who's uh, who's listened to my, any of my presentations before will know that um, I, I'm an academic. I like the sound of my own voice and I'm very prone to overrunning. One of the real benefits of being online is that I've got a little screen up on my computer here with my face in and I'm starting to appreciate how old and and unpleasant I am to look at. And that's one of the things that really prompts me to speed up and get through my presentations quicker. So you're saved by the apple in this presentation. Um, 
my mind goes back two years to Aviemore um, and the presentation that I did at this event two years ago. And um, at that time, we had just run a pilot study down in Glen Tress. Um, and I was waiting for ethical approval to collect some data. And that was a, a period of profound pain that we had to go through, but we did manage to collect some data and present some material around um, the findings of that pilot study around the impact of, of uh, mountain biking on psychological well-being and mental health of people with an existing uh, mental health diagnosis. What I intend to do over the next 15 minutes or so is to give you an update and some reflections about, about that work. Um, but for anybody who wasn't at Aviemore two, two years ago, I'm just gonna scroll back to just a little bit of scene setting. I think one of the things that health professionals now are very comfortable with is the idea that physical activity um, uh, has, has profound impacts on people's health status across the whole of their lives. Um, we were very comfortable 20 years ago with the idea that it had an impact on physical health. And really what's happened over the last 20 years is, you know, it's one of the most robust findings in exercise psychology is that for most people about a physical activity makes you feel better. And in the early 2000s, there was lots of groundbreaking research looking at physical activity and exercise in the natural environment, green or, or, or blue, if it's associated with water exercise. And what we know from that is that in terms of psychological well-being, enhancement of mood, exercise, a bout of exercise anywhere will do you some good, but a bout of exercise in the natural environment is plus plus, has an a, additional benefit. And the innovation that you know, we are very interested in, in um, in developing mountain biking and the mountain biking center of, uh, for Scotland is, is the extent to which this, this finding can be rolled out in this, in this context around, around mountain biking. Now, I'm speaking to you from the Scottish borders and we have world leading uh, opportunities for, for mountain biking. Uh, and that's why we went ahead and we ran the, the project collaborating with the NHS in the borders and Scottish Borders Council uh, and developing mountain biking. And what we were able to do was to, to host a project in, in, in Glen Tress um, over a, 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 a effectively a nine week period where people were um, with an existing mental health uh, condition were recruited and were given the opportunity to, to engage in mountain mountain biking program. And so what I'm intending to do now is just to reflect on some of those findings and think about where our thinking is going with that. I haven't frozen. <laughs> A lot's happened in two years. What I'd like to tell you about is that we've successfully bid for additional funding to roll out a massive comprehensive program of mental health related mountain bike courses, recruited and trained staff, bought kits, recruited researchers, published our findings. That's what I'd like to tell you about, but that hasn't happened because unfortunately the real world has intervened. And the real world intervened um, almost exactly a year ago that Graham and uh, Neve, uh, an occupational therapist from Scottish Borders Council, NHS Borders, who worked with us on the project, and myself went up for an interview with a major national funder to apply for a very substantial sum to fund the project. And we got to, I think, the last 10 nationally, uh, which would have supported the whole project going forward, certainly over a period of three years, and we missed out. We missed, very narrowly missed out on that funding. And since then, um, Christine, Graham, myself, have been working really hard to try and find alternative sources of funding to support this project. And hopefully over the next 15 minutes or so, I will really cement the importance of this work. So the other thing 
that's happened to us, this incidental thing that's been happening to us since March is COVID. Um, it's almost marginal. It's, <laughs> of course, I'm joking. It's a massive impact. And it's really easy to get very gloomy about the, the prospects for work going forward. But one of the things that it has, particularly me as the person who was brought in to evaluate the project, it's given me an opportunity to build some reflective time in um, around building networks. And from that, looking at collaboration, framing better questions and thinking strategically about how best to push the, full, the project forward. Again, I think you'll probably recall that one of the things we did, if you were in Aviemore, one of the things that, that Graham did was to was give the first viewing of a, of a fantastic little video which summarised the project. And I was astonished how, um, I hesitate to say it went viral, but I was astonished the interest that that generated worldwide. I was getting emails for several months afterwards from people all over the, the globe asking what we did and how we did it and what we found and how they could use that framework to develop their own projects. And that network of, of potential collaborators um, is something that, that, again, I hadn't anticipated, but it's absolutely fantastic because what it does is to immediately give us sounding boards around the world, sounding boards for lines of theory, things that I hadn't thought of. And again, it helps us to kind of frame questions around, you know, what our next step should be. And obviously within the constraints of, of the time and the, and the, the, the resources that we have, um, where to go next. Okay, now for a massive revelation. I'm not a member of the Instagram generation. Yeah, well, there's a surprise, 57 year old man. My kids say, dad, it's just not for you, okay? But what I am very aware of is, and it may well be that I'm just very much more sensitized to this, is that if you do have a little look around Instagram and you look around mental health and you look around sport and you look around mountain biking, you see an awful lot of posts which have this kind of basic framework. There's a picture of a bike in a natural environment. It could be a mountain bike. Sometimes it's a road bike, other kind of bikes, e-bike. But next to it, there's this hashtag around mental health. This is my therapy. Now this really fascinates me, okay? Because these are people reaching out through Instagram, through social media, first of all, around how they, how they use their cycling, what they're cycling, what motivates them to get out and ride. But also it brings in this, I do this for my mental health. So again, in terms of framing questions, one of the things again that really interests me is to what extent does cycling offer prevention? Does it allow people to manage in order to maintain? And for others, to what extent is this an active self-help intervention? Now, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I want to find out because when we start, as any scientist, I go through the kind of the stages of my thinking, observation, description, explanation, and then intervention. And we can only intervene optimally and effectively if we understand how things work. So I want to understand more how this notion that cycling acts as therapy actually works. And so the reflection I'm now going to just walk you through is around the data that we collected from Glen Tress and how, how I framed it. The context for this could not be more pressing. Okay, on 20, 20th of October this year, Sam H, um, and I've collaborated with Sam H on a number of projects now. Um, Sam H produced some data that was collected um, in the early stages of the COVID lockdown earlier this year, between March and May, they surveyed 
Um, 3,000 people across Scotland, um, the majority of them uh, uh, did not have an existing mental health um, condition. What they found was that there, was, there were increased prevalence in a whole raft of, um, of, of mental health conditions across the whole spectrum, from the really the very most serious type of diagnoses all the way through to disruptions in mood. And I think, it, again, you know, the period that we've all lived through, I think a lot of us can have got more insight into that now that the isolation that we've all experienced through COVID, through being away from friends, family, the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that we're, we are all looking for a way of managing our own, our own emotions and our, 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 own, um, uh, our own mood. Again, what this data showed us was that these were more prominent in young women, in, uh, in young people, in people with existing mental health conditions, and people in lower socioeconomic groups. This isn't gonna go away with a vaccine, yeah? These conditions are unfortunately extremely difficult to intervene with. Even now, to the optimism that we're feeling around the vaccine, there are still going to be lots and lots of people who are profoundly anxious to go out into open spaces, to mix with other people, yeah? Who will not be uh, easily convinced to change their behavior, to return to, I hesitate to call it normal. Yeah. And these are going to be exacerbated in people with existing mental health conditions. Physical activity, particularly cycling, mountain biking, has th th there is a role to play. One of the other things that I have, have started to really think about because it helps us to understand mechanism is what does it actually mean to be psychologically healthy and you know go back to the world health organization definition you know a state of, of mental well-being a state, state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or, his or her own potential and can cope with the normal stresses of life um, my view of this is that actually currently normal stresses of life means something completely different at the moment. That so, there are so many different anxieties which we're being presented with. Um, personal, family, community, employment, education, all of these. And again, you know, a vaccine is perhaps the first baby step in resolving these. Yeah. Everybody has their own unique narrative and again, going back to those pictures that I see on Instagram, yeah, that perhaps, you know, the, the very minimum that a bike ride can do is to provide some respite. Can we do better than that? Can we divide it into interventions using mountain biking to go beyond just providing respite? One of the issues around the normal stresses of life is that, um, all of this is compounded by we just we don't know when it's going to happen going to end yeah so a lot of us are relying on this these kind of self-help type interventions yeah and again can we do better than that another reflection that i've engaged in around the, the glen Tress pilot study was to think about what recovery actually means and Recovery in mental health is, is a, a hugely controversial topic. Um, this definition it really helps because it contextualizes it in, 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 in the notion that, that um, sometimes the condition, the underlying condition will not go away, that there will always be constraints and limitations placed by that, that particular illness, but there's still the opportunity to live a satisfying, hopeful and contributing life despite the diagnosis. And again, through reflecting and, and having, having some space and time to think about how it fits into the literature, you know, this is a model of, of, um, of recovery from uh, Leone in 2011 around, you know, what does it mean to be 
on the pathway to recovery. It's around connectedness, it's around hope, it's around optimism, it's around identity, it's around meaning, and it's around empowerment. And I think this really, this idea really resonates, resonates with the idea of, of physical activity writ large, but specifically mountain biking as therapy. Again, I apologize, this is quite a busy slide, but I wanted to, I wanted to get, it, get it in here. But one of the things which was really prominent in the, um, in the findings from our pilot study is that um, a skillfully delivered, a skillfully designed and delivered intervention um, creates a therapeutic alliance between three parties. The ride leaders are integral to this. Um, the therapists are integral to this, and obviously the clients and, and, and participants are integral as well. But there is a dynamic between the leaders and the therapists that it's very, very difficult to do both roles, to design you know, a safe and um, challenging uh, and, and dynamically risk assessed um, you know, ride experience and to deliver theory, uh, de deliver therapy is very, very difficult. Yeah. And again, just reflecting back on that, that earlier Instagram post that sometimes self-help may not be the best therapy, but again, under the present constraints, and this is another, another um, element of the SAMH data that they collected, is that, that currently people with existing mental health conditions are finding it very very challenging to to access their normal support services um, people have to first of all be be brave enough to try and get through the, the screening process in order to get probably not a face-to-face -face meeting it would be an online meeting with with a psychologist a gp a, a, a nurse practitioner whatever so unfortunately the self-help often is the only type of intervention that people have access to again that can be that can be you know, a, a real disincentive for, for people um, uh, to, to go that step further and again we're trying we're trying to understand how best to design these so pulling my presentation together our next steps this is what i want to do okay i'm very keen i'm an academic i'm a researcher we're looking to fund research to find some of these answers about the best ways in which psychological um, well-being and mental health can be maintained through through mountain biking. And then, and this is really important because you know we're really guilty of this as academics. We're you know we're really really good at doing research and we're not very good at disseminating it. And this is one of the the, the real bonuses and one of the, 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 the motivations by the, behind the Innovation Centre to be based at Inalethan is this dissemination of practical wisdom about how to best to deliver mountain biking as a therapeutic intervention. There is, trust me, so much more than I could say, but I'm going to stop. Tony, uh, thank you very much for that. That was a fantastic presentation there. I've um, got a few questions now uh, before we move on to Leslie. Um, some short ones, some longer ones. Um, do you ever think cycling? Do you ever think cycling will be prescribed on the NHS like we've been reading recently? Yes, I, I firmly believe that's going to happen. the The big issue with with persuading medics is everything in medicine is is needs to be evidence-based and uh, so, so particularly for mental health we've got to we've got to generate that kind of groundswell of 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 research evidence which can and not surprisingly because because there's a cost involved medics are quite you know they want to know it's not that it's the best treatment but it's but it's more effective than the next best one yeah and Unfortunately, resources, particularly financial resources, will be a, a critical in there. Okay, thanks. Another one here. <clears throat> Is there an or have your studies shown an optimal time or a minimum time 
to ride the bike to get some or the most benefits? I wish I could answer that. I don't. I just. I just don't know. Um, my my view is that that just ride doesn't matter. Five minutes, five hours. Yeah. Even at, even I I know from myself. You know, a bad a bad day on my bike is better than a good day in the office. So terrible cliche, but it's true. <laughs> um. Thank you for that. Uh, how? If one of the issues is lower socioeconomic backgrounds, how can we get more people, you know, from an affordability mm. affordability area into into mountain biking and to, to get those benefits is another question. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And again, if I had an answer to that, I, I, I would probably be sitting on a, a, a you know a government panel somewhere. Health inequalities are everywhere, um, and. You know, there's just some stark facts about about Scotland, but but we we know that we have to take them seriously. We know we have to design interventions, which you know address that as an issue and make and make mountain biking as accessible in urban areas, in lower socioeconomic areas uh, across the country, which do tend to be tend to be urban, um, not not exclusively, but they tend to be urban. Um, again, armed with that knowledge, I think it helps us. And it helps us to, to, to think about how we, how we make the impact that we want to. Thank you. A couple more quick ones before we go into Leslie and then we can answer more at the end. Um, what could you do with the funding? What's your next steps? I know you, you, you'd you outlined it earlier on the last slide, yeah. but, but what, in a nutshell for the group here, what would be, what would we've, be your we've got a, take this We've forward? got a model. Um, I mean, with Graham and 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 Neve, we you know on, on that particular pro program we had a model where we had a partnership between the you know the the, the ride leaders and the ride providers and um and and the, the therapy staff that's what we want to do next roll it out we want to use to use funding to to provide training resources for ride leaders and for therapy staff um yeah we want to evaluate those programs so that we can very, very clearly demonstrate benefit. A couple of quick ones, sorry. Uh, good one here, uh, one that I've been thinking about. Does something like Zwift offer the same benefits? I imagine part of the benefits is being out in the forest, but what about sitting on your, your turbo trainer in your garage or living room? This is very provocative because I'm going to get, I will get into an argument with my physiology colleagues. Um, if it was, and Zwift works for, for lots of people, it's, you know, it's, it's brilliant. Um, and I'm a bit of an addict myself, but riding outside is different. Riding, and it, again, it's one of the things about those Instagram posts is that I don't know whether those, those folk posting those photos are riding on their own, riding as part of a group, whether they're thrashing themselves up the hill or they're having a nice leisurely run. I've got no idea. Yeah, but what they're saying is it makes a difference. Brilliant. A final one, I'll, I'll ask this one, um, just for anyone out there who might want to pick this up with you offline, how can companies or how can uh, organisations get in contact with you and what could they potentially do to take this forward? Okay, um, they can either contact me directly or they can contact Danny. Yes, uh, any, yes. Any, any of the of the team here and you'll, you'll, you'll get through and... Um, Honestly, we will be biting your hands off if you're interested. Yeah, because we, you know we need we need partners. We need people who have, have um, the the imagination. Yeah, to 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 engage with this as a, as an issue, and I think the returns will be will be huge. Yeah, that potentially, you know, you're you're part of a uh, of a project which massively impacts on one of the biggest public health issues that's facing us post-COVID. Okay, Tony, thanks for that. Uh, just end it there for Tony. If anyone's got any other questions, keep adding them in. Um, I'll keep a note of them and we can add them in at the end. Um, I'm going to pass over to Leslie now. Leslie will share her screen when she's ready. I'll have a presentation and then time for, for questions from Leslie at the end. But thanks once again, Tony. Over to you, Leslie.
I should know how to unmute now that I've been teaching online for so long, but it still takes me a while to catch up. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really great to be able to present today. So thanks to Developing Mountain Biking in Scotland for giving us this opportunity and to Danny and Tony for that session there. So I'm going to completely um, change tact here um, and talk about the immune system and talk about some of the work that we've been doing with athletes and, and some of the research that's out there in the field and why we think this is really important um, moving forward. So first of all, um, we have to think about infection risk in our athletes and, and is it something that we think it is important um, and you know what, what impact does that really have on them? And right in the very early days of exercise immunology, um, we really just believed that endurance exercise was the key culprit here. And it was the thing that zapped your immune system whenever um, you were taking part in, in those sort of activities. But research has developed and we now know that we have a fairly substantial list of, of factors that actually contribute to this. So being in a COVID environment, we'll all be aware that poor hygiene and exposure to sick people is, is something that is really key within this and, and definitely increases infection risk within our athletes. The season that we're in, um, again, probably highlighted by COVID for many of us this year, but the winter and autumn months tend to be the months where we're exposed to more viruses and we can become uh, more ill. And that's the same with, with um, our athletes and they you know, encounter normally about four episodes, which is of illness um, during that time, which is the same as the general population. We know that air travel and poor sleep have an impact on infection risk. And we saw a really nice study come out recently from the Australian Institute of Sport that looked at female athletes that had low energy availability. And those athletes were four to eight times more likely um, to uh, have an infection than people who, weren't, who didn't have that low energy availability. Tony will, will like this, adding on to that, those individuals that were stressed or depressed or were anxious, their, their chances of becoming ill actually increased with that. We also see changes in terms of with training loads, sometimes with training camps, although that data is a little bit difficult to, to really tease out what's happening there, because often you have air travel, you have um, increases in training load, you've got changes in environment, which all we know can infect, uh, impact on a person. And then we have competition levels. So we know that there are differences between national and international athletes. And it's believed that a lot of that is to do with the programs that these athletes are on and, and the education that, they're, that is provided to them during this. And we can also measure um, microbial bacteria within athletes in both saliva and tears. And, and when these levels are low, we see that increase in, in infection risk in these athletes. And when I'm talking about these infection risks, I'm talking about upper respiratory tract infections and, and gastrointestinal infections. And, you know, you might be thinking, well, is this something actually that's really pertinent to our athletic population? And the literature is really telling us, yes, it is. So second to injury, illness is, is the second factor that will stop people training and competing uh, during the Olympics. And we know that sickness um, you know, if, if athletes are sick, it means that they have reduced days training, which does not marry with an elite athlete's career because we need them to be able to perform high levels of training and we need them to be able to do this on multiple days over the course of the year. We also know that medal winners um, experience fewer and importantly shorter, shorter bouts of these infections than their successful counterparts. So there's obviously a relationship that's happening there with, with their immune system and with their athletes. And I'm going to take you all back to um, biology and I'm going to try and keep this snappy for you. Um, but basically, we need to have a bit of an understanding of our immune system and what's actually happening with, within that. So we've got two main compartments of the immune system. We've got an innate immune system, which is kind of like our first line of defense. It's not specific. It basically just any foreign substance that is getting into our body, it wants to either prevent it getting in or if it does get in, it wants to try and eliminate it out as quickly as it possibly can. So the first layer of that is our skin and our mucosal membranes, which we find in our mouth and our eyes and in our nose and our skin. We then move on to our white blood cells. And really when I'm talking about the, the immune system for the rest of this presentation, it's white blood cells that, that I'm focusing on. 
And they're the real, real key fighters uh, within our body that are trying to eliminate any of these foreign substances. So we have our NK cells and, and this guy looks pretty angry here on, on the graph. He's got lots of dots within him that you'll see. And he's a real fighter. He's going to absolutely try and eliminate anything as quickly as possible as it gets in. And he's going to release all of those dots and try and kill it as quickly as possible. We then have our neutrophils and our monocytes, and they're kind of like the Pac-Men of our immune system. So they go around munching up anything that's left behind or any viruses that are there, and they will try and limit the, eliminate them that way. We then have the second arm of our, of our immune system, and that's a required immune system. And this is much more specialized. So this is the reason why we get things like vaccinations. It is able to store memory. It takes a little bit longer to, to act and to respond, but once that immune response occurs, it, it's very, very powerful. And it's important just to highlight here that these things don't act by themselves. It's almost like an orchestra. There's a harmony across all of these cells within the immune system, and they're continually talking to each other where the, the innate immune system might signal to their acquired immune system, and then they're sending out signals for different responses. Now these cells all have different functions within the body and that would be the whole talk today if I even tried to cover that. Um, so we're just going to be aware that that happens and we can identify all of these cells by their cell surface markers. So we're able to at the university basically strip out these white blood cells from samples. We can chuck them into a test tube, add in some antibodies. We put them into a special machine where we fire some lasers through them. It sounds way cooler than what it actually is. And we can actually tell you what your immune makeup is. And why is this important? Well, we know um, with exercise that we start to see an immune response. So here we've just got a graphic of our peripheral blood system. And here you can see there, before exercise, we've got some of those immune cells floating around in there. And they're basically just surveying. So they're just looking out to see if there's anything that they need to respond to within that blood system. When we compete and, and perform a bout of exercise, we then get a really massive increase of these cells into, into the blood system. And they'll be coming from, they reside in the tissues and some, some key organs within the body. So they're coming in, the body's under stress to see if there's anything that they need to, they need to action. An hour after exercise, we see a mass exodus. So they all then leave the blood system. And it's believed during this time that they're going to areas where they might be required. So if, we're, if you've performed a very heavy bout of exercise, they might be going to the lungs if there's some inflammation that's there. They might be going to muscle if there's muscle damage, etc. Now, the key part of this is that this is a stress response. So the immune system is actually responding to stress and it views exercise as a stress. This is really healthy, this is what we want to see. But the immune system will also get this response to other stressors. So it will get the same response if we are psychologically stressed. It will also get the same response if we you know, deprive people of sleep, et cetera. And the other part that we're really interested in at the university is then the aging of those cells within the immune system. So here I'm focusing on those memory cells specifically. And what we have within our body is those memory cells can be split into two main compartments. So we have naive cells. That means they've never encountered um, a virus or a pathogen, an external body from the body before. Um, or if they have, they then develop into a memory cell. And those memory cells are specific only to that virus that they have encountered before. So they're the reason why we get um, vaccinated. So sometimes we're much more efficient at holding on to that vaccination than, than other times, and we only need to immunize once. Or other times the virus is you know, very clever and it'll, it will change and it'll adapt like the flu, and we need multiple um, vaccinations throughout life. But what we start to see as we get older is that when we're young, we have loads of these naive cells that have never encountered anything before and very little memory cells. But as we get older and we go through life and we're exposed to a, a lot more challenges in terms of our immune system, that ratio flips and we end up with a system that has a lot more of these memory cells and less of the naive cells. So it means that 
our immune system just isn't quite as good as it used to be and those challenges can can start to have quite a big impact on it so we're interested in in, in this field of research in terms of exercise we're starting to see some nice research coming out of populations who exercise through life and and we're seeing that they're getting a better balance of these cells depending on their exercise levels but there are always times when things start to go wrong and and a lot of the time um, at the university we'll conduct research but we also work with with individual athletes as well and uh, i know there'll be a few athletes that are out in the audience today or people who are working with athletes and often what we get presented with is, is a case like this so here's just some um, example data of an athlete who's maybe been for a test they've they've presented some of their white blood cell data to us and they're saying you know i don't feel right I've, I've i've not really been you know maxing out my training can you tell me in terms of my immune system um what's going on there and that's where it starts to become really tricky for us so we can do certain things. So we've got a bank of data that we can go and we can look at different athletes within different sports to see what the norm is. And we'll also look at against clinical norms. But the key here is those clinical norms are actually quite wide. And most of the time, people will sit within those clinical norms quite easily, even if they are experiencing you know, these, these lulls in training or, or just not feeling quite right. So what we really want to do and sort of highlight to everyone today is, you know, the importance of actually monitoring athletes over time. This essentially, if you just present us with one blood sample, is like taking a photograph. You might be, you know, riding down the trail and you get a really good photograph and the next second you've fallen off your bike and it's not telling the whole story. It's exactly the same with your immune system. So what we would really, we really like to do and and what we would like to progress with is monitoring athletes over time, over, over months, over seasons, over years. And when we start to do that, we can start to almost create a norm for those athletes and have a look to see the differences that are occurring. So within this graph, it's just an example of that exactly here. And I'm just going to highlight a few key parts. So you can see that we're starting to see quite a, a drop within the immune system in this section. And this was actually after a bout of intensified training. The athlete didn't get ill. There, were, there was no uh, performance decrements. Performance was actually increasing. They were extremely tired because it was a really hard training bout. But because we could monitor this, we could just make sure that they were fine through that whole period of time. You then see a more substantial drop within, within this athlete's data. And this was when we actually then tried to change their body mass. So we we're trying to change body mass and body composition. So they were on quite a restricted diet during this time. And you can see it's had quite a big impact on their immune system. And they did actually get ill after this. But because we had this data, we were able to recognize that early on. And we were then able to um, get them back to training. They, they actually only spent three days off the bike after this because we caught it so early. So when we have this data we can start to really understand and work with it with our athletes to enhance their performance as much as possible because athletes will get ill it's impossible not to make them for them not to get ill and then really you know one of the areas i'm really interested in as well is then what is happening to our athletes so not just now when they're competing but in later life can we start to monitor their immune system for longer periods of time so we really understand in terms of training, the impact that's having on their immune system and that aging part of their immune system. So I've hopefully dumped a lot of immune, immune stuff on you, but hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. Um, and really in terms of our department and, and where we're really looking forward, forward to moving into is really encouraging athletes, coaches, anyone who's out there to, to start looking at the immune system in your athletes. It's really important. It, it can unlock a lot of keys, but you need to be taking regular samples throughout different time points of the season um, so that we can really start to build an immune profile for those athletes and understand when those alterations are good or bad. Um, an area that the department is really interested in moving forward with is um, research into female athletes. Despite making up around 50% of the population. Uh, female athletes, females full stop, have been uh, lost from research for a number of years because of the menstrual cycle and people viewing it as too difficult to, to test and to, 
to analyze that. But there's a real change in that at the moment and, and we're looking forward to, to doing some research in this field. And we actually have an MRES student who's going to be starting this March, who's going to be starting exactly that. So she's going to study the influence of training on menstrual cycle in a mountain bike athletes. So if you're an athlete, please make sure that you're watching out on our Twitter feeds, etc., because we'll be recruiting for participants during that time. And we're really hoping that that's going to be a, um, a worldwide study where we can harness lots of data to help really understand the impact of menstrual cycle um, on training and whether we should be training female athletes in a different way. So that's my whirlwind tour. Um, thank you for listening. And uh, thanks to everyone that's involved, both the uh, Edinburgh Napier and also the Mountain Bike Centre of Scotland. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Leslie. It was a great presentation. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'll just do a couple of quick questions. Uh, before I do that, if anyone wants to keep putting in their questions online uh, for Tony, for Leslie and for Lewis's ones coming up or anything that I said in the introduction, just keep adding it in there. It stays there and we can ask it at the end. Um, Leslie, um, do different types of athletes have better or worse immune systems? So, for example, endurance or short intensity uh, background athletes? Um. It doesn't, I've not seen any data based on the sport. It would be more down to the individual. So mainly with the immune system, it's about the challenges that it's faced during your lifetime. Um, in terms of the different sports, we'll have slightly different challenges to your immune system. So if you are doing endurance-based sports, um, it can take your immune system slightly longer to recover from those bouts. And if you're doing more intense based activities and um, so it's really key with that to try that's where you're trying to get the balance in terms of your training to make sure you're, you're recovering between sessions brilliant uh, another quick one uh, sorry there are more I, find, I doubt you'll have the answer to this but you may have seen something COVID-19 um, is there any initial probably not a study but a uh, report saying of any athletes that have had COVID-19 and how it's compromised their immune system uh, I've not seen anything, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing most of the athletes will be keeping that one quiet if they have had it, um, because, you know, in terms of there'll be, there's big competitions that are coming up, and, you know, um, yeah, I've not, I've not seen any data from that. I, I think it will probably be a few years away for us seeing that kind of data coming out. Brilliant. Listen, thank you very much for that, Leslie. Um, we're going to move quickly on to Lewis. Uh, Lewis is going to talk about the next 12 minutes up to about 5-2. And then we'll have time for Q&A with uh, the whole panel there. So without further ado, uh, Lewis, on you go. OK, thank you very much to uh, Tony, Danny and, and Leslie there. Uh, Leslie's done a lot of the, the heavy lifting for my presentation here with the immune system. So thanks very much. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about widely vibration in mountain biking. Going to talk about a few examples uh, of vibration in mountain biking and cycling in the wider context, uh, a little bit about our latest work, so moving towards vibration in the human body, and briefly future work and some commercial work that we, we have conducted. Uh, so all the work I'm about to talk about is a combination of myself and a lot of support from uh, Dr. Leslie Ingram Sills, Dr. Mark Taylor, Dr. Reed Malone, Professor Garrett Floyd James, everyone at Mountain Bike Centre of Scotland, uh, developing mountain biking in Scotland and Edinburgh Napier. So thanks to all of you guys. So back in 2018, I spoke to you a little bit about moving uh, or using the standardised the ISO measurements for hand arm vibration in the workplace uh, and applying this to mountain biking. And the, the sort of exposure limit value uh, the marker in the sand from ISO is five meters per second per second. And the reason we want to use these measurements is, as I say, it's a standardized measurement criteria. So you have to have uh, the right equipment and use the right analysis in the eyes uh, of the ISO. So you can compare across, say, cycling disciplines or indeed industry. And this is important because if uh, research has shown that if you're exposing yourself to excessive hand arm vibration on a regular basis, you can end up with hand arm vibration uh, syndrome, which is an irreversible condition uh, negatively affecting the peripheral nervous system, the peripheral circulatory system, 
the musculoskeletal system of the hand and arm. So it's not something that you would like, especially uh, long term, if you want to grow old and, and ride bikes like myself. So as, as an example, uh, as the data I showed you in 2018, 23 minutes of racing enduro, you can see up to 6.61 meters per second per second. That's quite a long way past the recommended value. And just to add some context, one hour of riding a city bike on cobbles uh, will bring you up to just below five. Uh, so you could conceive how that'd be possible um, in Edinburgh, for example, if you're commuting. Uh, one hour of smooth tarmac, so, uh, I think in this case it was middle meadow walk. Uh, if you rode that for one hour, you'd be sitting down at 1.14. So that gives you an idea in terms of variation that's on offer. Uh, and as a little caveat, if you ride cobbles on a road bike, uh, such as you'd find at the Paris Roubaix, that time to get to near five is reduced to 10 minutes. So that's going from a city bike with nice big comfortable tires and riding position to a road bike. So you can see that the equipment is going to have a big effect on, uh, on the vibration exposure. And for a long time, we were struggling to, to measure this in the field because of the size and the complexity of the equipment. But in that picture there, uh, I'm actually conducting some hand arm vibration uh, exposure measurement, such as the advancement in technology. So that's where we're at the moment. The field is moving uh, towards collecting data in the field. <clears throat> and so the reason uh, that we really became interested in this, uh, and if you look back through a lot of mountain bike literature, um, you can see that there's a big gap between the typical uh, measurements of uh, intensity and duration, which come together to give you training load between mountain bike racing and road racing. So in our mountain bike enduro participants, we saw around 503 arbitrary units per week. And in very, very similar participants in the road from another study, they were doing almost double, so 77% more than the mountain bike riders. Um, you can see this again if you go and look at your heart rate when you ride downhill you're not pedaling but you can see your heart rate can sometimes be even higher than on the climbs and this is interesting when you consider when we want to know why this might be uh, and we went down the route of looking uh, as les was saying about the the immune function so every time you do a bit of exercise you start from your normal uh, level of immune function immediately after exercise you will have a slightly enhanced immune function and then in the period of recovery, so usually one to four hours after you've finished exercise, you will go through uh, a small period of suppressed immune function. If you allow yourself to recover uh, and start again from there, then you should be grand to keep doing that. But as you can see in the diagram here, if you, if you follow the green and then the blue, start from a lower baseline and repeat this process over a period of months to years rather than days to weeks, then you can end up with chronic suppression. And we're wondering if that's if it's maybe this model that's self-limiting the mountain bike enduro population here. So in order to, to kind of investigate this, um, we, we went to an international enduro race. You can see our, our tent set up there. Uh, and we did some of the work that Les uh, touched on there, where we took blood from people. We separated out the white blood cells. Uh, we shone lasers at them, which Les said, Les said it unfortunately, isn't as exciting as it sounds. And we counted the different populations. In this case, populations of T helper cells, T cytotoxic cells, uh, natural killer cells. Uh, and those are both innate and adaptive immune components. So we also measured their heart rate. So we were looking at their training load that way. And we measured uh, the vibration exposure using the, the unit, which is on the far right there uh, as the participants rode. And we calculated the vibration exposure over those race stages. And what we're trying to do with this, if I just go back a second, is, is to establish how much of this shape where we go from the normal to enhanced and then to suppressed uh, is how much of that is coming from load that we can detect in the heart rate and how much is coming from the, the vibration exposure that the, the athletes are experiencing. So we took blood before, an hour after, and the morning after. It was too complicated to get uh, a muddy mountain biker across the finish line of an enduro race and take a blood sample straight away. And uh, to do this, we combined the training load and the vibration to look at the change in cell populations. And I feel like we all need cheered up on a day like this. So what better way to present your results than a meme? Uh, so we've got Drake here telling us that a heart rate based training load wasn't actually any good at all in telling us the, the immune response. So the change in cells from before to an hour after was actually dependent 
or, or explain largely by vibration exposures. And this was in quite a small sample, and we still have quite a long way to go in terms of doing controlled uh, tests to, to investigate this relationship further. So it's still early days, uh, but it looks like at the moment that more vibration uh, is a bigger stress for the body, which may lead to a longer recovery being required, say for the equivalent road ride. So if you get your training score back on, uh, on training peaks or whatever platform you use, maybe this isn't reflecting uh, perhaps the true uh, stress of that exercise bout, but also tells us why uh, it's important to look at ways to bring the numbers that I showed you in the first slide down as much as we can. So we can look at riding our bikes more with less recovery time, ultimately in my mind, because riding bikes is really fun and that's what we want to do more of. So we're looking to make bikes better rather than say that we shouldn't ride bikes. And of course, like most research, uh, we answer one question and we look at future work and we realize we've got a lot more uh, questions to answer. So there's plenty of examples on here and this is not an exam uh, exhaustive list of what we would like to do in the future. And a lot of this will be made possible, hopefully with the, the Mountain Bike Innovation Center in order to put more of the control back in our hands, uh, especially when we, we get the indoor test track and the, the instrumented outdoor test track. So that, that should give you a flavor of, of what we're looking to do. Um, and just a note to say as well, unfortunately I can't talk too much about it, but we have now completed our first commercial project relating to uh, the vibration testing of a product. Uh, it's all, all been successfully delivered, uh, so we are open for business. Uh, we did this outside. Um, there are still some restrictions obviously with COVID, uh, but we, we, can still, we can still do work. And I wouldn't limit it just to mountain biking. Uh, obviously you can see there, uh, that was my road bike from 1987, collecting some data. We've got uh, G and Tom in the middle there, uh, Tom towing him on an e-bike wearing the XN suit, which we uh, would like to use more in the future. And if you would like to read a bit more about what we can offer, then there's a wee pink bike article there if you haven't seen it already. Um, but yeah, definitely do get in touch with us if you have some ideas. We, we are solutions people uh, and we're, we're here to help hopefully. So I should give you an idea of what, we're, what we've been doing. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to, to G and Les for all their help supervising me for, through my PhD, Mark Taylor there and his moped, uh, Dr. Eve Malone, Dr. Tom Campbell, and of course, Danny Cow uh, and everyone else that's helped me along the way. So thank you very much. And if you would like to get in touch, then my email's there or my Instagram. Um, I thought I'd make up for Tony's, Tony's lack of presence there. So you can get in touch. So thanks very much for listening. I'm aware time's probably getting on now. So hopefully that was interesting. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lewis. Much appreciated. Um, you've still got time, everyone, to, to type in some questions for, for the whole panel now. Uh, just for the, the remaining five minutes of the session, we can uh, open it up to the to the panel here. And just off the back of uh, Lewis's um, uh, presentation question here, uh, product advancements, Lewis. Uh, what new products do you see improving or worsening vibration in the future? That's a loaded question. And I think I've had the answer. Tony said he would be sat in a government panel. I think I'd be sat in a beach in the Caribbean. Um, but no, I think, they're, I think we're getting through the phase of making products strong enough to survive in the, in the mountain bike world. So we're seeing less and less things break. And now we're getting to the point where there's a lot more technology coming on to look at how to improve the ride comfort or reduce the vibration so i think i wouldn't limit it to any particular uh any particular product if that makes sense i think there's a lot of stuff in the market that we need to to get our teeth into and see if it works so i, I genuinely wouldn't limit it at this point in time and then off the back of that one if i can word this correctly um are modern bikes or newer products um i haven't word the story uh, Will they ever solve vibration or will we just go faster and cause more vibration? Uh, I think there are situations in which I, I originally would have said yes. And I think as time goes on, we might see that actually, no, it's possible to go faster with less vibration. And that's, there's a lot of caveats to that answer because if you go so fast that you're on the track for less time, then it's less time you're exposed to vibration. And if you're in more control, maybe you can avoid the holes. So then you can end up, it's like, 
it's a can of worms, but no, I wouldn't say that's the case. I'd say there is a way we can get away from it and improve, improve comfort and speed from what we've seen. I think I know. I think I know where you were going with that. I can't quite get my head around it either. Um, question here on other bikes. Um, uh, mentioned earlier on about riding over the um, uh, the cobbles and so on and so forth. Is is there anything with with that exposure? What's the, what's the worst vibration says here? What what causes the most damage or long damage? Is it short, high intensity, or is it long duration? Do we have any studies on that? Uh, so it depends on the terrain that you're on in terms of what gets you uh we see different usually it's either a lot of stutter bumps or like low level high frequency or it's big hits and big compressions which will contribute it's rarely both and in terms of what what situation will be the highest i still think that the paris Rebay study which was done a couple of years ago now uh is the highest numbers that we've seen so far uh in terms of fitting in with the iso guidelines so they for whole body vibration, they exceeded the daily limits within 65 seconds of riding uh, or, or something very much similar to that uh, on on the paris Rouvet, which is really, really quick. So on the plus side, at least mountain bike is not the worst thing you can do on a bike in terms of vibration. But yeah, and, and yeah, we, I, th I think we'll find more answers to that as we collect more data. Okay, brilliant. That's it coming up to four o'clock. Um, and I realise everyone's probably been staring at their scene screen since about quarter past nine in the morning. Um, so just before we go, uh, a couple of closing remarks from myself and then uh, if uh, Tony, Leslie or Lewis have anything final to say. For, for, for me, um, if anyone out there, uh, as I mentioned before, if you're based in Scotland uh, or you're based out with Scotland and you want to engage with us, please contact us. There's really no silly ideas, silly products. And also, if it's not been covered in, in what we've spoken about today, we have a whole load of other expertise. We have, you know, product design engineers, composites experts, and throughout Napier, throughout Strathclyde and other universities and backgrounds, we've got a great big supply chain of expertise and, and companies that we can engage with. So I would say don't be a stranger. Email mtb at napier.ac.uk. And if we've not answered your question, um, then, uh, then then please email us afterwards. Uh, I realise everyone will be tired. So uh, any closing remarks from Lewis, Leslie, Tony? Any calls to action or, or, or pleas to the audience out there from any of you? Any of you go forward? Everyone happy? Okay, I think we'll close it a day there. So yes, thanks very much to, to Lewis, Leslie and Tony and the guys from Expo North and also the guys from DMBNS. And uh, as I say, drop us an email, anyone, if you have any questions. But thanks very much. See you thanks later. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Lewis. Thanks, Leslie. Bye. Thanks, Tony. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.